this is, of course, the old Morris chair that he had. And he had this for many, many years because I can remember back in, in the 1920s when I would see him in this Morris chair down in South Shaftesbury and down in the gully. And he brought it up to uh, his cabin up in Ripton. There we would see him. I'd pull up a chair and we'd sit down there and we'd have a long talk about all kinds of things. And we would talk for maybe two, three hours. Time meant almost nothing to him in terms of having conversations with, with people. But this was his writing board, this was his chair, and here was his walking stick. And I used to go walking with him, and he'd take that stick, and he had a very, very rapid movement, like a fox walking along, quick step. He used to do much of his thinking on these walks. What specifically do you think he was looking for when he went out into the woods or took a nature hike? Well, Scott, he was pretty keen about natural things, and on the long walk that we took up in the long trail, going up toward an orchid swamp, as we went up the rise, he was looking at every little thing, the different kinds of flowers, uh, even the little creatures along the way, squirrels and so on, and flies. We stopped, it took us quite a long time to get up we were only walking perhaps about two or three miles, but we spent all afternoon doing that. And when we came to the orchid swamp, we went way in deep into that swamp. And while we were on this walk, he was talking all the time about this, that, and the other things. He was even contemplative in his walks, meditating a great deal. And uh, as you see here, he had this, this walking stick striding along with, 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 with that. Um, this was, I thought, one of the most wonderful things in my experience being with him, because he would say things and say very, very good things on these walks. Was he always a teacher at heart? Yes. Um, Scott, I think that's the best image to use for Mr. Frost. Um, you could say from, from one viewpoint that he was a point teacher, and I mean by that that it was not anything pedantic. He was not a pedantic teacher at all, but a very imaginative teacher. And I remember his coming into my classroom on one occasion and talking to the students for two consecutive hours, and each hour was different from the other. He was talking to two different groups. Um, I feel this carries over into the man himself um, so far as as Mr. Frost goes, I think that a unity of purpose exists between uh, the Poit and uh, his own character. And Poit and person were one and the same piece. But the dominant image that comes back is of Frost as a very imaginative teacher and able to take and stimulate, reach all of us, whether we're listening to him in a large auditorium or whether we're talking to him separately, individually, down in his cabin. This was very impressive. What do you think it is in his work that sets this man apart from other poets? Well, I'd have to say three things about that. I think in part it is um, certainly his view to our human experience. Um, a very affirmative point in our time, and I think this has been one of the large elements in his appeal. And I would also say, certainly the subject matter, catching this New England background, these regional aspects of uh, stone walls and birches and books um, and the witness trees, all of that comes into it too. But above everything else, it's got to be that language that he used. And remember how he said that poetry for him was a renewal of words. And this is what we feel in his poems those speech rhythms of his. He called them talk songs, and that's a wonderful way to take and describe Robert Frost's poetry. They're talk songs, the speech rhythms, and along with the speech rhythms, I'd have to say that his attitude toward poetry, the way that he approached poetry was kind of remarkable and very individual. He always thought of it, as he said, as a little voyage of discovery. In other words, he didn't come with any um, planned idea about what the poem was to be, 
but it became a little voyage of discovery as he moved along through the poem. And I think this is one reason why stopping by woods in a snowy evening is such a remarkable poem. Or directive, or neither out far nor in deep, or that wonderful poem, The Witch of Coas. Little voyages of discovery on his part, little things he was tuning up as he wrote these poems. There's a deceptive simplicity in his work, isn't there? Right. And I think this is the thing that isn't always understood. Um, lots of people say, well, we know his poems, we understand them at once. Well, some of these pe po people either overread or tend to underread his poems. Take a line like, the fact is the sweetest dream that labor knows. A wonderful de simplicity and a deceptive simplicity in that line. You simply take a poem by Poe called to science, and the poem called to science, Poe will say, for example, that the, or would have said that the dream is the uh, sweetest thing that labor knows. But Frost reverses that. He says, the fact is the sweetest dream that labor knows. And what he means by that, just the mowing of the field, or the sight of stars at night, or listening to a thrush in the dark woods, those are the things that really appeal to him very much. And underneath those are, the, are the, the images leading to kind of symbols. And that, I think, is the real depth of Robert Frost, in a way. It's like looking in, into a brook sometimes, and the water can be so clear that you can look down and see great depths in, 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 in the stream itself.